In this video, we're going to continue to look at exponential functions. And we're going to look at them using a format called point ratio form. Okay? Before I talk about point ratio form, let's talk about the traditional format of an exponential function. It's y equals a, b to the x. And it is where uh, y is the starting value or the initial value. D is the multiplier given by some rate of change, turned into the appropriate multiplier. And X is the number of changes that occur under that multiplier. And Y is then the output, which in, will give us the new value after that number of changes has occurred. Okay? Now, when we move to point ratio form, which is given by y equals y1 times b to the x minus x1, it looks a little different. One thing that looks similar to it, though, is the fact that they both have b, the multiplier, written into them in terms of this new point ratio form, as well as the traditional way of looking at an exponential function. Okay, so how are they different? Well, if you notice here, where we have the initial value, we don't. We actually have this thing called y1, okay? And this is what makes point ratio form a little different. Well, you can't talk about y1 without talking about x1. And what it's saying, and I talked about this in class, is that as long as you know the multiplier in an exponential scenario and a point from the data set, it doesn't have to be the initial point you could write it in this format. So as long as you know some point that's in the data set, or if you think about it graphically, on the curve, you can apply this format, again, as long as you have knowledge of the multiplier. So there's infinite correct ways to actually write some exponential function if you know the multiplier and all the points on the curve. So we're going to see how we put that to work a little differently than this traditional format that you guys have seen in this word problem here. So what does it say? It says, Casey hit a bell in the school clock tower. Her pressure reader held nearby measured the sound intensity or loudness at 40 pounds per square inch after 4 seconds had elapsed and at 4.7 pounds per square inch after 7 seconds had elapsed. She remembers from her science class that sound decays exponentially. Well, as soon as we hear that, we should start thinking about some type of exponential function, okay, which is going to look like one of these two things. In this case, it's going to look like this point ratio form. Okay, so why point ratio form? We, this brings us to the first question where it says, name two points that the exponential curve must pass through. Anytime we deal with two points, it's a great time for point ratio form. And also an indicator is that you don't know the initial value, okay? So that's going to bring us to identifying two points in the problem here. So let's talk about my independent and dependent variables, which you should know are synonymous with x and y. And if you notice, this scenario talks about loudness and elapsed time. Well, it would tend to make more sense to me if we made x the time and y the intensity or the loudness because it does make sense to say that the intensity depends on how much time has elapsed. And obviously it's going to continue to go down as time elapsed because the sound is decaying or just wearing out. It's not going to get louder as time goes on. Okay, so what does that bring us to? It brings us to this xy tree. So we just need to identify these two uh, instances from the problem that pair intensity with time. Okay, well the first one we see is that at 4 seconds, it's 40 pounds per square inch. And at 7 seconds, it's 4.7 pounds per square inch. Okay, obviously again as time is going on, the intensity or loudness is decreasing. Now, as we continue to the next question, which says, find an exponential equation that models this data, again, we said, well, when we don't know the initial value, but we know two points, it's great for us to be able to use point ratio form. 
Now you're probably confused because it looks like you're supposed to use one point. Well, let me model this just a little bit for a second here. Okay? And you'll see why having two points is good for us to have. So I'm going to take these values and plug them into this formula twice. So what is that going to give me? That is going to give me, in the first instance, 40, excuse me, y equals 40 times b to the x minus 4. And in the second instance, it's going to give me y equals 4.7 b to the x minus 7. Well, we said that if we assume that the multiplier is the same in both these scenarios, we can write this function as many different times as we want as long as we know a point on the curve. Well, here we know 2. And because we want b to be the same in both of these, we could say that they are, in fact, on the same curve. So what I can just do very simply is put these two equations equal to each other. So I'm going to write 40b to the x minus 4 is equal to 4.7b to the, excuse me, 4.7b to the x minus 7. Okay, well now I'm going to solve for b. Well, you might be sitting there saying, how are you going to solve for b? You've got this x in the problem too, so it's got two variables. Well, just be patient. Let's actually start by trying to get our b's on one side. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to divide both sides by b to the x minus 4, which cancels it on the left and then creates a expression like this on the right. Okay? So the result of that is going to be 40 equals 4.7 b to the x minus 7 over b to the x minus 4. Taking it a step further to get my b's isolated, I will divide by 4.7. Okay? And again, this is all in an attempt to be able to find the exponential equation. If I find an exponential equation in this form or this form, I've got to find b. Okay? So, where does this take us? Well, we see that we get 40 over 4.7 is equal to b to the x minus 7 over b to the x minus 4. Well, I can use the division property of same bases on the right side of this equation and just subtract the exponents down. So I'll continue with 40 over 4.7 is equal to b to the now I'm just going to subtract x minus 7 and x minus 4. I'm going to write it out so you realize that when I subtract the x minus 4, I've got to think of it as a quantity. So it gives me x minus 7 minus x plus 4, which in fact gets the x's to cancel, which is great. And negative 7 plus 4 is negative 3. So it speeds to the negative 3. Now from here, we just need to apply... Uh, the property of exponentiating both sides here of this expression to the reciprocal of negative 3. So what's the reciprocal of negative 3? It's negative 1 third. So just some golden rule of I'll do this on both sides of the equation. Okay? And that in fact is going to on the right side cancel because the rule is to multiply exponents when you're raising an exponent to an exponent, which is fabulous because that helps me get b by itself. And then I'm just going to go to my calculator to find out the answer to the left side of the equation, which is 40 divided by 4.7 to the negative one third. And this gives me that the multiplier, if I just round it off to a couple of decimal places, or actually I'll take it to four decimal places here, a little bit arbitrary, but you have to realize that exponential functions can be sensitive, so I'm going to round this to 0.4898. Okay? Now that is not the answer in terms of finding an exponential equation. In fact, 
it's this one part of it. It's the part of it that we have as a multiplier. Well, all I need to do is then combine that with one of the points. Well, there's two correct answers here with the information I'm giving. The first one, I'm going to use this point of 4 comma 40 with this multiplier, and I'm in fact going to write y equals 40 times 0.4898 to the x minus 4. My other option for this with the information that I'm given is to use the 7 comma 4.7 point with the point ratio form and write y equals 4.7 times 0.4898 to the x minus 7. Again, just plugging in what I would think is x1, y1 to either of these equations is what allows me to write both of these. Now again, what you want to remember, these look different. But by the theory of the point ratio form, if you graphed both of them, they would be the exact same equation. So you would only see one graph if you did it on your calculator. So then the question becomes in uh, section C, in part C, is, well, how loud was the bell when it was struck at zero seconds? This is a very straightforward question here in the regard that they're saying that T equals zero or X equals zero is just plug in zero. Now which function? It doesn't matter. You're going to get the same thing regardless of the function that you use. So I'm in fact going to plug it in for the first one where it goes y equals 40 times 0 0.4898 uh, excuse me, to the 0 minus 4 and I will just go on my calculator for that which is just going to give me 40 times 0.4898 to the 0 minus 4. And this is saying that the intensity of the bell looks to be about 695 pounds per square inch. Okay? So, again, this problem hinged on the fact of using point ratio form. The reading clue for this, again, was that you were not given an initial value, but you were given two points on the curve. And again, that little bit of a weird idea when you look at the form, it looks like you need one point on the curve. But having two scenarios of it allows you to write the exact same equation in two different looking ways but in fact are equal. So you can set them equal to each other and solve for B and then use B in either one of these equations which uses either one of these points just adhering to the point ratio form. So if you wanted to uh, try this out to see if you didn't believe me take your zero and plug it into this equation and I guarantee you get 695 pounds per square inch. So this was a way for us to use point ratio form. It is an exponential function a little different than the traditional form where you do in fact know the initial value.